So again, this is the atom to atom continuum. And let's go through each of these steps one by one. So you may not have had chemistry and you may not know much about the periodic table, but here you see an arrangement of all of the atoms, all the elements. So we see, uh, for example, on here we've got carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. You've seen these before, helium, hydrogen. And we'll talk a little bit more about the chemistry and about what atoms are as we move through this course. But this will be the fundamental unit that will start with our hierarchy. Now, those atoms are the building blocks for making molecules. Simple molecules like H2O, water, or CO2, carbon dioxide. Those molecules are the building blocks of the macromolecules, as we've already discussed. Those are the proteins, the carbohydrates, the lipids, and the nucleic acids. Those macromolecules are the building blocks for the organelles. Those are the functional units, the parts that work within each cell. Those organelles are going to include things like the mitochondria or the Golgi or even the nucleus. In chapter 3, we'll come back and we'll study some of those organelles. Those organelles are the basic building blocks of cells. Within your body, you have over 250 different types of cells. And you have over or about 75 trillion or so cells within your body. Now, the cell is the most basic or fundamental of all the living things within your body. The cells are going to combine those 250. Uh, 50 different kinds of cells and those 75 trillion different cells are going to combine now to make your tissues. The tissues um, come in four different groups as we'll describe here again in a moment and these tissues are going to have specialized function. Again the study of tissues is histology. So the tissues come in four basic types. We've got connective tissue. This is going to include things like bone and blood and cartilage. And again, we'll be looking at each of these under the microscope, learning how each of these uh, looks and where they're found in the body. Then there's muscle tissue. Muscle tissue comes in three types. Again, we'll look at each of these. This is going to include skeletal muscle, the kind of muscle that moves your skeleton, smooth muscle, as, for example, what's found in your intestines, and cardiac muscle, which is found only in the heart. Then there's epithelial tissues. These are going to be the tissue types that cover your body and cover your organs and line your body cavities. For those who are in lab, when we think about serous membranes, those are epithelial tissues. And then finally, there's nervous tissue. This is specialized for conducting electrical signals, and we find lots of this nervous tissue in the brain and the spinal cord. So those are the four different types of tissues. Those tissues now are the building blocks of organs. For example, liver, heart, kidney, brain. And those organs are going to combine into those 11 different organ systems. Excuse me. Into those different organ systems. that we will be studying as we go through the course. So 11 systems, actually we'll be studying 12, again, because there are two reproductive systems. So let's go through these body systems. And as we go through this, what you want to focus on is, number one, can you recognize it by a picture? Maybe this exact picture or maybe a different one that's in the uh, visual anatomy book or in your textbook or your, or your lab book. Uh, can you recognize the major organs of the system? And number three, what is this system doing for your overall organism? What's its function or purpose? So here's the integumentary system. It's going to include the hair, the skin, the nails, and the uh, sweat glands that are part of your integument. Now, as far as what the system's doing, well, it's helping to protect us. Uh, it's regulating our body temperature. It's the site of all of our receptors for feeling and touch and temperature. Uh, it's also, though, where we make vitamin D, or at least we begin that process. And so we have to have our skin to make vitamin D. 
Second system, pretty straightforward, the skeletal system. It's all of your bones. It's providing support and protection, but it's also where you're storing lots of calcium and phosphorus. And it allows, with the muscular system, for you to move your body. And it's where all of your blood cells are produced. That may be the thing you're least familiar with. Within your bones, you are making your red blood cells and your white blood cells and your platelets. Now, I don't want you to confuse the skeletal system with the muscular system. When I think of the skeletal system, I want you to think support, protection, and structure. And leave the movement of the body to the muscular system. Because muscle is it's specialized in movement. Yes, it needs the bones as a bunch of levers. But when you think of the skeletal system, think of protection and structure and support. And when you think of muscles, think of movement. But also, this is where we generate heat. If you're cold, you're going to shiver and that's going to generate heat. Number uh, four, I think it is, this is the nervous system. You see yellow in this diagram. Yellow is that universal color in anatomy books for the nervous system and nerves. This is going to be not only the nerves of the body, but also the brain and the spinal cord. And the nervous system is responsible for collecting information, both from the internal and external environments, uh, integrating and processing that information, and then sending signals out with instructions. The endocrine system. This is a series of glands, all of which secrete, which is what crin means, into or within the body. So endo means within, crin means to secrete. So the endocrine system is a series of, of hormone secreting glands. If you look at this image though too quickly, you might just see the brain. Well, if you see the brain, your first answer might see, would be, oh, that's the nervous system. Or, hey, Mac, I see the heart. That must be the cardiovascular system, the stomach. Oh, this must be the uh, digestive system, or I see a kidney. This is the urinary system, or I see the testes. This is reproductive. But collectively, all of those are hormone-secreting glands. So collectively, this is the endocrine system. Then there's the cardiovascular system, red and blue, arteries and veins, the heart, pumping not only blood, but don't forget the blood is also carrying oxygen, nutrients, waste products, hormones. So there are many, many things being distributed by the blood and by the heart. Lymphatic. Here you see green as that universal color. So when you see these green vessels, these are not green blood vessels or green nerves. These are lymphatic vessels and they're carrying a lymphatic fluid called lymph or interstitial fluid. And the lymphatic system includes the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, a number of other structures that we'll come across as we go through the course. When you see the lungs, you're thinking respiratory system. Please look at the spelling of this. Um, for some reason, um, I get a lot of misspellings on this word. So please look at the spelling for respiratory. And this is the system that's responsible for taking in and exchanging oxygen for CO2. The digestive system, I see the intestines, the stomach, the liver, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the esophagus. These are all part of the digestive system. Remember, we also use the word alimentary canal. And this is going to be absorbing nutrients and uh, breaking them down and expelling waste products. The urinary system, a couple of kidneys, a couple of ureters, the bladder. Uh, this system is filtering the blood, removing wastes in the urine. And we'll talk about this system toward the very end of our semester. And then we'll end up with reproductive systems, both male and female. The male reproductive system uh, with the testes and the production of sperm. And finally, the female reproductive system with the ovaries, the, the uterus, the vagina, the breasts, all of these are, are part of the female reproductive system. Uh, functionally, we've got the production of, of eggs. We have the production of hormones uh, and also the nourishing and protection of the embryo and the fetus. So all of these systems are going to combine now to make you and me, right, the, the organism. What you need to be able to do as you look at these images is, number one, recognize these systems from a picture. So recognize them. Know the organs found within each, and know the functions of each. Now, the, le the lecture exam will be largely multiple choice, Scantron. 
So it's not like you're going to have to write down the five functions of the integumentary system. Instead, the question would be, which of the following is not a function of the integumentary system? Or perhaps, the following functions are all related to what system? So study these in that regard, not to fill in the blank, but simply to recognize each of these characteristics as a part of one of the body systems. So again, when we put all these systems together, we get the organism. Now, in a regular biology class, or a general biology class, that organism could be an amoeba, it could be a flower, or a bumblebee, or a whale. In this course, we're dealing with human anatomy, so we'll be uh, dealing primarily with, with the human, but I don't want you to forget that other organisms are made up similarly of a hierarchy. So that's the anatomy. That's the atom-to-atom -atom hierarchy. We also need to think about the physiology. So let me introduce a couple of terms here that we'll be using throughout the next two semesters. The first is homeostasis. Homeo meaning similar. Stasis meaning to stand still or to be static. And the idea is this. No matter how different the external environment you are in, no matter how cold out it is, your body's going to maintain a pretty stable body temperature. No matter what you're putting into your body, uh, food-wise, your body is going to try desperately to keep your blood sugar levels in control. No matter how much fluid you have in your body, your body is going to try to keep your blood pressure relatively constant. So the idea of homeostasis is that we're keeping your internal environment as constant as possible. Not flatline, not exactly the same, but within a reasonable range. And this is the key concept within physiology. I'll show you this idea of negative feedback in a moment. Negative feedback is the way by which our body maintains homeostasis. When the body can no longer maintain your blood sugar, no longer maintain your salt concentrations, no longer maintain um, your calcium concentrations, then we have a name for those and they're all diseases. So when your body can no longer maintain its homeostasis, then there's a disease state associated with that lack of control. And on the bottom here, I, I stated that every one of your body systems is involved with maintaining your homeostasis except the reproductive system. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify that answer. Um, I'm going to argue that all the systems are maintaining your homeostasis because the reproductive systems um, certainly are making hormones and those hormones are a big part of your body's overall well-being. Now, I mentioned that cells um, are living things, and we are, after all, studying a biology class, and bio means life, and ology means the study of. So whenever you pick up a biology textbook, you're going to notice in the front chapter uh, a discussion of the properties of life. And so here is a list of six or seven things that that are going to be characteristics of things that are living. What I want you to see is that sometimes defining life is not easy. There is a little bit of wiggle room here. So what is living? Well, some people say uh, life is the absence of death or death is the absence of life. Well, what is that life? So all living organisms are going to basically be similar in that they're going to be organized of cells. Now here I have plural. But don't forget that bacteria are single-cell organisms, and they're just fine as a single cell. All living organisms have a metabolism. That's a fancy way of saying they take in energy and they use it. They're all going to respond to their environment. This is going to help them prevent injury and damage or perhaps give them an advantage. They're going to grow and develop. They're going to have a life cycle. They're going to reproduce more of their own. And along the way, they're going to regulate all of this through this idea of homeostasis. So if these are the characteristics of life, and I've told you that cells also are living things, then we should expect individual cells to also carry out this same list of requirements. And we, and we see a similar list here. That is, a cell also regulates its internal environment, a.k.a. it maintains its homeostasis. Number two, it takes in and uses energy. That is, every cell has a metabolism. It responds to its local environment. 
It's going to know what its neighboring cells are doing and respond to those cells. It's going to have a, a complex organization. It's going to be made up of organelles. And finally, it's going to make more of itself by having a reproductive cycle or a life cycle. So the question I have for you now is, is this egg alive? This is the egg you buy at the grocery store. It's not a fertilized egg, but it is nonetheless considered a cell. Is this egg considered alive? And I hear most of you saying no, because it doesn't, for example, it can't reproduce on its own, can it? And it can't re really respond to its environment very well. It's kind of static. Well, okay, if, if you're going to argue the egg is not alive, what about sperm? Is sperm alive? <laughs> yeah, I see a lot more hands going up now. Well, sure, sperm wiggle, so they must be alive. But think about it. Can sperm reproduce on their own? No. So what I want you to appreciate is that, yes, we call them sperm cells, and yes, we call them egg cells, but they really don't contain or carry with them all the characteristics of life. So sometimes this definition is a little bit more difficult to nail down, as you might imagine. In the conversation of homeostasis, I told you that uh, homeostasis is maintained by this idea of negative feedback. So what is this? Well, negative feedback is the idea that when your body's blood pressure, for example, begins to go too high, that there's a mechanism in place that will tamp that blood pressure back down to normal. Or vice versa, when your blood pressure gets too low, there's going to be another mechanism to raise your blood pressure back up. So the idea is that when your changes in your body start to get larger, when the, when the deviations change, the body has a way of resisting those changes and minimizing that difference. It's sort of like the thermostat in your house. Let's say it's the summertime, you've got your house set at 70 degrees on the thermostat. Does your house stay at exactly 70 degrees? No, it's going to modify, it's going to fluctuate between 72 and 68. It's going to go up and down around 70 degrees, but it's not going to be held at exactly 70 degrees. There's going to have to be a receptor that monitors those values. There's going to have to be a control center, the thermostat, that's going to compare uh, what you set the thermostat to to what the environment is. And there's going to have to be a, a, a unit downstairs or on the roof that's going to affect change when needed, the air conditioner or the heater will kick on or kick off. So to see this visually, here, this, this graph could be anything. It could be your house temperature. It could be your body temperature, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, whatever you want to talk about. And what we see here is this idea of a set point, that there is a, a temperature or an ideal setting, the optimal number. Let's say it's 70 degrees on your thermostat. But we recognize that the temperature goes up and down. When the temperature gets too high, let's say it's the summertime, the air conditioner comes on, doesn't it? And drives it down below 70, maybe as low as 68. And at 68, the air conditioner turns off. Well, that's a correcting mechanism, the AC turned off. And then the temperature will once again rise in the, in the house and will come back up and will continue this cycle up and down, up and down. Again, that's exactly what your body is doing. And because there's a corrective mechanism, this is considered negative feedback. Negative feedback is not a negative thing. It is a strange term. I, I appreciate that. But negative feedback is not a negative thing. It is absolutely important and necessary for our body to do homeostasis. Give me a second here to move forward. Now there's also uh, this idea of, let me get back here, sorry. 
So we have negative feedback. There's also positive feedback. Now, positive feedback is when, uh, when something starts to move away from the normal, it actually accelerates or increases the deviation away from the normal. Now, there are some examples of this. There aren't that many, actually, in the body. One is during labor. During labor, the uterus begins to contract under hormonal control, and labor typically continues until completion, until the baby is delivered. Or when milk flows from breastfeeding, when, muck, when the suckling begins, the milk lets down, there's really no mechanism to stop that. Or, as I'll show you here, an excessively low blood pressure. So let's take a look at this. So the, the darker blue area represents the normal. So this is where your body is trying to keep your blood pressure within that range. And something happens, um, and there's a bleed out. You're bleeding out excessively. And so as you're beginning to bleed out, the blood pressure is dropping lower and lower and lower. Now, unless you're able to stop this, you will continue to lose blood and lose blood pressure. And as you see, the value is going further and further and further away from norm. While this is not a, po a positive outcome, this is an example of positive feedback. So the value, as it began to deviate, got further and further away, and there was no real mechanism to push it back up. Okay, it was nothing there. The last four or five slides I want to share with you are simply different imaging techniques. I know some of you are going into diagnostics or imaging, and as you're doing research and as you're reading your textbook and other resources this semester, you're going to come across x-rays and PET scans and MRIs. And I want you to appreciate what these different techniques allow you to see. And perhaps you've already had some of these techniques done to yourself. So we've all had an x-ray likely. And an x-ray, you know, is a beam of x-rays, pretty high powerful stuff that's going to go through your soft tissues and be absorbed by your bones and your teeth and your more dense tissues. This can include a tumor. So you can use an x-ray to look for bones, look for fractures, look for tumors, right? A mammogram is, a, is an x-ray looking for a solid tumor within the breast. The problem with x-rays is that one tooth can block another or one bone can block another or a tumor cannot be seen because it's obscured behind a bone. So we need to be able to take views from many angles when using x-rays. There's also sonography. This is basically ultrasound. You're using the same technology that the Navy uses to scan the bottom of the ocean or to find submarines. Uh, those high frequency sound waves are reflecting off the internal organs. The good thing is you're not using harmful x-rays. It was until recently that it wasn't the sharpest of the techniques, but with computer enhancement now, uh, sonography has come a long way and is much, much sharper. We can also use x-rays to do a CAT scan or a CT. That's the same thing. And you're using a computer to help you make thin slices through the body. Now, with that extra assistance, you no longer have to worry about one hard object blocking another object. So by making multiple thin sections through the body, you don't have to worry about overlapping structures. And these are quite sharp. And again, you're looking at solid tissues uh, with CT scans. If instead you want to look at soft tissue, then you want to look at an MRI. An MRI is going to be really, really great for looking at brain matter. You can see the brain here or looking at joint spaces, looking at tendons and ligaments. That's what you want to look at for an MRI. You're using a magnetic field that's actually going to cause the protons to uh, realign in the tissues. Extremely sharp. Also with computer enhancement, so you're getting, again, the idea of many, many thin sections through the body. In older systems, these could be rather claustrophobic-like tubes. Now we have open MRI, so that's no longer really an issue. And then lastly, I want to share with you PET scans. PET scans are another great way of imaging uh, positron emission tomography. And what you're using here, at least in this example, is radioactive glucose. Now, glucose is a sugar. It's taken up by all of your cells as an energy source. So in a PET scan, we're going to use some uh, computer enhancement to see, for example, on this brain scan, you can see the red area. Now, that red area would be considered a hotspot. spot. 